Good evening. It is time for us to get started. We've got a few announcements we need to make tonight. Um, let me remind you, if you are uh, visiting with us, please fill out one of those green cards in the, uh, on the back of the pew in front of you and pass those to the outside aisle. We can get those picked up. If you are a member with us, we are um, back to doing the white cards. So most of you have been doing that, but please um, continue to do that for us. And then if you're with us online, um, there's a place for you to sign in there so we have a record of your attendance. So we ask that you will um, do that for us. Um, not a lot of additional announcements. Uh, we need to remember Cassie Bowie Williams. Um, she is overdue in her pregnancy, and so um, we just need to remember her in our prayers. In our prayers. Um, Diane Oaks is having hip replacement surgery on the 25th. Uh, remember all those that are out sick. We've got a lot that are out with COVID and other illnesses. Um, so make sure you remember those. Jesus Camacho has COVID. That's Jacob's dad. Um, remember him as well. The community outreach project for January is to help the patients at the cancer center. Um, please bring Ensure Boost or any type of protein drink to help them maintain a healthy weight and place those in the tub in the hallway. The Happy Hearts ladies will get together in the Fellowship Hall this Thursday, January 27th at 10. They'll be working on projects for the community outreach program. Uh, Katrina Berry Ivy may have or may still be looking for, uh, for help from young, young people to make Valentine's baskets or cards. Please see her for details. She probably would take help from, from any of us as well. Um, there's a kit team address list on the table in front of the church office for those who have not picked one up yet. Security team this week is Dan Turner, Kane, uh, Haynes Cole, Philip Taylor, and Craig Chun. Um, I do have a thank you card from the attorneys that says we we wish to thank everyone for all the prayers, cards, and messages sent during the illness and loss of my parents. We are so fortunate to have such a kind and caring family at West Main. Please continue to keep us in your prayers. Love in Christ is the Turney family. Um, remember Perry Britt's sister, Andrea Bartlett, Bartley. Um, she has COVID and has been put on a ventilator, so please remember her. Um, there's also a, a card that was read this morning to the uh, Happy Hearts Ladies Group. Um, thank you for the toys and Christmas tree for Austin. I'll put that in the back that was read this morning. Um, I'm not aware of any other announcements that need to be made, so uh, if you will, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this day, its many blessings. We're thankful for the opportunity that we've had today to come here to worship you and praise you. We pray that our worship has been acceptable to you. We, we are thankful for the opportunity to return tonight. We pray that our Bible study here will um, be beneficial in our lives. And as we are mindful of, of all those um, that are sick, we pray that you will watch over them. We are thankful for um, all the many blessings of this life. And we're thankful for this, for this church family. We pray that you'll be with the leaders of it. And we pray that you will uh, guide them in making good decisions that um, will help us to grow spiritually in your word and in your work. We are uh, mindful of those that are on our sick list. We pray that you'll comfort them and heal them. We pray that, pray that you'll be with those that have lost loved ones recently as well. Pray that you'll uh, give them comfort and peace. We are thankful for Jesus and his sacrifice. We pray that you'll continue to forgive us when we fail you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. sing ring out the message the first and last verse let's stand and sing this song
title of tonight's lesson is Thessalonians. Paul prays for the brethren. And the scripture reading comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Good evening, church. We have a good crowd here tonight. This is encouraging. Tonight we're going to continue in our study of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. <clears throat> I wanted to tell you that I, every Sunday that I'm here and, and that somebody's not sick or away, we have an elders meeting that they are gracious enough to allow the preacher to come in and sit in on. And it's always an encouragement to me because our shepherds are they're encouraging guys. And I'm also encouraged by the leadership that they show. And, you know, as we come out of all of the craziness of the last couple of years, there's several exciting things on the plate. Of course, we had our renewal last fall and we had a couple speakers coming in. We're planning that again for this fall. Still working on who we can get, but we, I know they'll be good. And then also we have a summer series coming up, but I also want to encourage you to be thinking about on May 1st, we're going to have a friends and family day. And hopefully we can invite everyone we know, and we're going to have special invitations made up for you so you can give those out. We'll make it a big day, and I know you'll be excited about this. We'll eat together afterwards. That always lights the fire under everybody, but it's pretty exciting. My son Seth, where, they, where he preaches in California, he had been, he'd seen us do this where I've preached over the years, and it's always kind of an exciting boost in the arm. Let's us have an opportunity to share our church family with others. And so he had planned one, and they had their friends and family day today. Well, there at Roseville, they run about 80 to 90 on Sunday mornings, post-COVID. And he invited all, he goes and plays basketball at the gym every week with a bunch of guys and invited them and got the members to all invite their friends. And he called us this afternoon. It's a couple hours different, so we were actually on the way into town. And he calls us and we said, how did it go? And you should have heard that 21-year-old boy so excited because he said, Dad, we had 190 people today. Isn't that exciting? And it's just neat to be able to share your church family. So be putting that on your calendar May the 1st. You know, this year our theme has been and will continue to be Stronger Together. And for this first quarter, we're focusing on being stronger in love. And that's the reason I chose the book of 1 Thessalonians. On Sunday night, I, you probably have observed, or perhaps you haven't, that I have a kind of a mode of operation that I've been functioning in for the last 30 years in preaching. And that is, on Sunday morning, we have kind of individual lessons. Sometimes they're a topical lesson on a particular subject, or sometimes they're a textual lesson. I preach very few expository lessons, although I do actually know how to do it. But expository, we define that in the preaching world as if you're preaching from a specific text, you kind of stay in that text and you don't really go here or there. Well, I think it's more effective to preach the whole counsel of God. So you'll, that's why if, even if I'm preaching through a text and draw this main points from that text, I'll often go to other passages to reinforce those points to show that this is not just an isolated opinion or idea from this particular author, but it fits into the beautiful, beautiful counsel of God that's found all throughout Scripture. So that's called textual preaching. But on Sunday nights, you'll notice that I always preach through a series. Sometimes it's a New Testament book, sometimes it's an Old Testament book, or sometimes it's a theme from the New or Old Testament, like the life of Abraham or something to that effect. But I do that for a very specific reason. And that's why I cherish Sunday nights. In fact, I, I wanna say deeply from my heart a great level of appreciation for all of you who come out again for the second time on Sunday, come back and worship. 
Sunday nights have been kind of going away in a lot of congregations for many years. And after COVID, I know of at least a dozen congregations that had a strong Sunday night and aren't even going back to Sunday night. Now, it's not doctrinally essential that we have a Sunday night service. The New Testament talks about worshiping on the first day of the week. So you can do that once or you could do it twice like we do. I suppose you could do it 11 times and it wouldn't be unbiblical. If you could get people to come back 11 times, that'd be quite impressive. But we could do it. There's no, nothing in scripture that dictates the frequency with which we worship. But on a practical level, I cherish having Sunday night services. I cherish it. Even though I suppose it's less work on a preacher if you don't have to preach twice on Sunday, I still cherish this time together for this reason. <clears throat> My task is to preach the whole counsel of God and to mature everyone in the congregation. That means that I need to give milk to those who need milk. Remember that passage in Hebrews that you should be on to me, but you still desire milk? And the text also tells us that we should desire the pure milk of the word. So when are we supposed to provide that to weak members? Well, we all know that there are sometimes folks who are here on Sunday morning who perhaps are still growing in their faith and haven't developed a level of commitment that they desire to come back Sunday night, Wednesday night for other special events, meetings, etc. And so those folks need to be fed at a level that they can relate to, that they can continue to grow little by little. But also on Sunday mornings, we have the very mature and very strong folks in the faith. And so how on earth is a preacher supposed to preach a lesson that meets all of those dietary needs, spiritually speaking? There's also the issue that in the United States over the last 200 years, we've developed a mode of evangelism that really revolves around our Sunday morning service. I mean, y'all all know that's true. We're going to have a Friends Day where you can invite people to what? To the Sunday morning service. And pretty much most of the evangelism that we do involves inviting people to church. I don't think that's wrong. It wouldn't be necessary. We don't really see that as the main mode of reaching out to people in the New Testament, but it works in our culture, or at least it has. But because of that, if we have any visitors who really know nothing about Scripture, they're going to be here most likely when? On Sunday morning. So that produces an even more intricate task to be able to feed the young and the new and the weak in their faith, to be able to feel, feed the strong and the committed and the devoted and the, those who are mature in their faith, and also to preach to those who are here for one time and one time only, and we may never see them again, or based upon what they experience that day, they may choose to come back or not. Those of you who preach, Doug and Troy and several others, you know that's a challenge. It's a difficult challenge. So what I have found through the years is Sunday night gives a great opportunity because folks who come back on Sunday night are often, now this is not supposed to be a critique of anyone. We want everybody here whenever they choose to come, amen? But those who choose to come back on Sunday night are often very mature in their faith. They know the scriptures perhaps a little better and they yearn for a deeper type of study. And so it gives an opportunity to preach through things that may not be appropriate for everyone on Sunday morning. And it also, the reason I choose to preach through books, Old and New Testament, is because it gives us an opportunity to never skip anything in the Word of God. I can tell you a secret. Preachers don't particularly look forward to preaching some topics. Um, giving is not one of the ones I love to preach on the most. Only because I've had a few experiences in the past. One congregation, the elders asked me to preach on giving four Sundays in a row. I tried lovingly to request that maybe I could skip it and, and preach once a month for four months, but no, they wanted four Sundays in a row. And indeed, we had a couple visit from the community, friends, they had been invited. 
They visited from the community. They heard lesson one, heard lesson two, never came back. And when we asked them, you know, would, would you like to come back? We did. Well, all you people ever talk about is money. That was their perception as outsiders. So that makes it difficult. Now, not that we shouldn't preach all those things. We must. But Sunday night gives us a chance to preach some of the difficult things that mature believers yearn for and can digest, so to speak. Also, it gives us an opportunity to make sure that the preacher's not just preaching the things he wants to preach. Because when I'm preaching through 1 Thessalonians and I come to a passage that's difficult, I'm going to preach it anyway. Because my task given by God is to preach the whole counsel of God. So, if you've wondered why we do it the way we do, that's the reason. Therefore, through the years, the greatest compliment I've ever received, and I've heard it over and over and over, is a, I think, kind of a sidelong criticism, actually, where I hear members say, that was a great lesson tonight, preacher. The only complaint I have, that's one of those but compliments, you know, you've heard those, that was good, but... But the only complaint I have is you should preach that on Sunday morning. And what they don't realize is that I intentionally preach that on Sunday night because they yearn for it, they grow from it, but it may be too much for some folks on Sunday morning to handle. So feel free to give me the sidelong butt compliment if you ever so choose, if you enjoy a lesson on Sunday night. So here we are. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Closing out the chapter in verses 11 through 13. Now you remember that Paul, all the way through this book, has almost been going overboard to tell them how much he loves that church at Thessalonica. He loves them. He appreciates them. He has that affection for them that we're trying to capture in this theme. That we're stronger together and we need to be stronger in our love. He made that abundantly clear in our text last Sunday night from the first part of 1 Thessalonians 3. And tonight he's going to close out the chapter with three verses, starting in verse 11 through 13, and he's going to pray for them. And I want us to pay close attention because I pray for you every week, and I hope you pray for me every week. I go through the prayer list and I pray for folks who are sick or struggling and try to make some calls or maybe send some notes and encourage folks. But sometimes I realize that I can grow in that prayer. I think our prayers should focus strongly on one another, our family, as we grow stronger together and stronger in our love. When we pray, are our prayers filled with concern for each other? And maybe it shouldn't just be when somebody has a need. Do we ever just pray for somebody that's not on the prayer list just because we love them? Just because we appreciate them? Just because we're happy about some great thing that happened in their life? Or we're happy to have them in our life? I think we need to focus on that more and more. And Paul teaches us some things about prayer in his example as he prays for these brethren in Thessalonica. Let's start in verse um, 11 through verse 13. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So here, Paul tells them what he's praying for. He uses this phrase, now may our God and Father. He's saying, this is what I want from God for you. This is what I request from God for all of you that are so beloved in my heart. Verse 12, and may the Lord make you increase. Verse 13, so that he may establish you. He's discussing, he's communicating to them what he's praying for for them. Do we do that? Do we ever just tell one another, you know, I've been praying for you. Well, I'm not sick. I don't have any. No, no, no. I've just been praying because I love you. I appreciate you. And I want God to give you abundant blessings in your life. 
Wouldn't that be an encouragement if we heard that from other brethren? So he starts off, and in verse 12, he says that the Lord may increase, that make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. His prayer centered on that they increase and abound. You see, that's what he wants for them, and that indeed is what we all should want for one another. He says, through the working of God. So he's kind of packaging this, of course, in the overall idea that he wants the Lord to be active and partnering with them in their lives, and whatever abundance they experience, that that to be because of and for the Lord. So above all, he's asking, Lord, I want you to be with them, and I want them to be with you. What a powerful statement that is. And then he says, increasing always. Increasing. You know, life is growth. Every, I mean, we know that's true. Everything, if you go out this year, Lenore and I were talking today about what we need to do to get our fruit trees ready. We are really bad at it, by the way. If anybody has any advice, we'll get the bugs gone one year and then we got worms the next year. So we got all these beautiful fruit, fruit trees and very little fruit. We're not good at it. But the thing is, is that the re way that we know that those trees are still alive and have potential is they bring forth leaves and they bring forth fruit. There's growth. That's true in all of life. When there's no longer growth, there's no longer life. And so he says, I want God to work in your lives. My prayer is that you be increasing, ever increasing, ever growing, ever advancing. And as believers, we need to understand that if we're going to be everything God would have us to be and be strong in our faith, we're going to have to be growing in our faith. Growing in, in the church, we should be giving one another opportunities to grow to do, to serve, to become, to mature. So he says our spiritual growth should be never ending, constantly increasing. In 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8, Peter says this, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter's take on this is he says, we need to be working on these virtues and it's a constant sense of growth. You never retire from being a Christian, amen? You never outgrow the need to grow. You never sit back... I've seen that many, many times through the years in the church, and I'm not trying to step on toes, but, you know, if it bothers you, wear steel-toed shoes. But the truth is, is that I've heard many times, we have been in congregations, and sometimes it's because some of the younger families don't step up and help and teach and things of that nature. We don't have that issue at West Main. We have fantastic younger families. But I have heard older folks say, well, you know, I taught for 20 years in the church, and I paid my dues. I've... I've done my time. Well, we need to understand that when it comes to service, when it comes to advancing, maturing, and growing, there's no retirement. It gives us an opportunity to continue to be more. And it doesn't matter if you live 50 years or 150 years. The Lord expects us to be growing because none of us ever arrive at the spiritual state God would have us be no matter how long we live in this world. That's why Peter says, add to this virtue, this virtue. Add to that virtue, another virtue. There's always another level to which we can aspire, to which we can grow. Paul says here that our inner man can constantly be renewed. There's a text in 2 Corinthians 4.16, also by the Apostle Paul, where he says, therefore, we do not lose heart, for even though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day after day. You see, that's the progress we're supposed to be making, not 
by the decade, not yearly, not monthly, day after day. That's the objective, to be growing constantly in our faith and in our lives, always increasing. And then we look and we see that Paul says increasing progress. I mean, it is just the ultimate of what the Christian life's aim is supposed to be. In Proverbs 4.18, it says, But the path of the just is like a shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. You see, however much our faith is shining forth, there's always another level of brightness to be dialed up in regard to our faith. And we need to constantly be working to increase. But not only that, Paul's not just telling them they need to be increasing. He's praying that they're growing and increasing. And what difference, I wonder, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I wonder what difference it would make in the lives of all of our members if we took time to pray that the Lord would help one another, help us to increase in our faith and continue to grow. How powerful could that be? And then he says, not only are they to increase and abound by always being increasing, but in more love for each other and for all men. Notice he said there at the end, abound in love to one another. He says that first. And then he says, to all, not just as we do to you. You see, our theme this year is so appropriate to the Christian message. Because Jesus tells us that by all, this, all men will know that you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. If only the Lord's church could have remembered that simple, basic, fundamental instruction in all of the divisions, splits, and arguments, and ugliness we've had through the years. That one of our polar stars needs to be that we're abounding in our love for one another we can always grow more in our love. In Philippians chapter 3, 13 through 17, Paul will say, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are high, behind and reaching towards those things which are ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of Jesus Christ. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind. If any of you think otherwise, God will reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us use the same mind. And Philippians is written also to another group of brethren that he loves so sincerely. That whole book is about the importance of them finding joy in their faith with one another. And so he says there, forgetting what is behind and constantly pressing towards what is ahead. And if there's ever an area where we need to be growing and pressing on, it's in our love for one another. We need to be making effort. Lenore and I talk about that a lot, about we've been so busy and, you know, everybody's got jobs and running around and family and, and then COVID on top of that. And we want to do more fellowship than we ever have. Because you don't grow in love with people you don't spend time with. It's just the truth. We need to spend more time together we need to make that effort and always be putting behind. I mean, yes, things were one way, but whatever's in the past, the good or the bad, we need to be pressing on, particularly pressing on in our love and our faith. In Luke chapter 6, Luke 6, 32 through 35, Jesus says, but if you love those who love you, what credit is it to you? For even sinners love those who love them. For if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is it to you? I think if Jesus had said that today, he would have said, if you love those who love you, what, what good is that? Even the mafia do that. I mean, isn't that true? Think about the worst people in this world. They have loyalties. They have people they love. The fact that we love our children and love our wives and love our family and love our dear friends, that's not a testament to the greatness of our love. Everybody does that, even the wicked. But then Jesus says, but, and if you lend to those 
from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners and receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. His point there at the end is that God has loved us so much. He's forgiven us so much. He's given us so many second chances. That should be the standard for us that we should be growing and constantly have it as our objective to grow in love, not, first of all, for one another, yes, but for all men. We should be aiming to be the most loving people in the world. It's so sad in some ways because Lenore and I have lived in a lot of places and one place that was such a paradox was when we lived in the Boise, Idaho area. I preached there for six years. And in that congregation, we had some of the finest Christians and they were very loving, but it was, it was difficult for us to determine who was more loving. People at church, and this isn't a criticism of people at church, it's just a, a sad commentary on the fact that people can even be caught up in false religion and be an example of love. All of our neighbors, all of them were Mormons. Boise has a higher concentration than Salt Lake City of the Mormon church. There are four pages in the phone book of Mormon wards. And all of our neighbors, every single one on our, on our street were Mormons. If you don't know anything about the Mormon faith, just leave it that way. It's very odd. It's very cultish. They believe that God used to be a, a man and that they can be a God someday. And that's just the icing on the cake. It's, it's a very strange type of faith and it's not Christian in any way, shape or form. But those were the nicest people. If you needed anything, they were willing to give it. And I mean, across the board, not one of them was nice. They were so kind, so loving. And I look at that and I think, People shouldn't think of Mormons that way. They should think of us that way. Isn't that right? They sh when they think the churches of Christ, rather than thinking, well, they're the people who, and you know, they're the people who don't believe in instruments, or they're the people, and that's true, we don't. And they're the people who think they're the only ones going to heaven. That's a misunderstanding of what we say, but we do indeed believe that baptism is essential and that there is one church. That's absolutely true. But rather than that being the first thing that come to people's mind, let's at the West Main Congregation make it our mission, our life goal, that in Tupelo, Mississippi, when people say West Main Church of Christ, they say those are the lovingest people in town. How's that for an objective? Those people are so nice, so kind, so loving. You know what? What a difference that would make. Jesus made us a promise by this, all men will know you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. And then we look at Philippians chapter one, verse nine, where Paul says, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more with knowledge and all discernment. So his prayer for them and indeed for us, and it should be our prayer for one another that we grow in our love. You know, sometimes there are conflicts and there are issues in the church. And sometimes there are debates, arguments, and even necessary division, particularly if it's over something doctrinal. But I wonder how often when we're frustrated at a brother or sister because of their attitude or the position they're taking on something or the way that maybe they're not handling it in the way the Lord said, I mean, sometimes we have to do what's necessary and say what's necessary, but are we praying for them that the Lord abound their love? That the Lord increase their love? Maybe Paul is teaching us that in everything, the first place we need to start is to pray for one another. Which leads us to his other statement in verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless and holy before our God. He prays that their hearts would be established. And he says, first of all, holy and blameless. In Ephesians chapter 5, 25 through 27, 
Paul says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it, that he might sanctify her and cleanse her by the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Holy and blameless. God's hope for us, Jesus' prayer for us, and Paul's prayer for them and you is that we be holy and blameless. And we need to preach on how we need to live, but we need to pray for one another. As we all struggle through this sinful world, we need those prayers that God would help every one of us to strive for righteousness. In Hebrews 12, 14, the Hebrew author says, pursue peace with all people and pursue holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. You see, again, as we talked about in regard to love and increasing in our faith, it's constantly a life journey. It's the quest of the Christian heart to be growing, to maturing, not only in love, but also in our holiness. We should be able to look back over our life, the years of our life, and say, well, I struggled. And, and part, of, part of Christianity is struggling. Part of walking in the light is falling down and getting up and keeping on walking. And thank the Lord that we're covered by the blood of Jesus. And we can have confidence if we're walking in the light. But even though that is true, we should be stumbling less as we mature down the road of life. Now, we'll still stumble. But if I look at my last year and I look at my first year in Christ, there should be a difference. The stumble should be more infrequent because we need to be growing in our holiness. Then he says, not only that they be holy and blameless before God, the Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. He says, I want them to be holy and blameless so that they will be ready for the return of Christ. Now, we don't talk about this much anymore in the church. And I don't know why that is. I remember as a boy, there were many godly men who would pray and they would say, Lord, come soon. And they would request. I remember one old brother would say things like, Lord, you may come tomorrow, but we pray that you come tonight. I don't remember the last time I've heard anything like that in our prayers. But Jesus is coming. Oh, I know, there's all sorts of doctrines that have floated around. I've been seeing on Facebook that there's a debate coming up on the AD 70 theory. If you don't know what that is, just like Mormonism, don't worry about it. But basically, there are those who say that Jesus isn't coming back. And I suppose they've been jaded by the amount of time. And it can just be so natural to think that that sun's going to come up tomorrow, just like it has every day of our lives. But the Bible tells us that Jesus will return as a thief in the night. That means that we can't look at the signs. We've been talking about that in Revelation. I can't look at what's going on in the world around me and be able to guess that a lot have tried and they have been wrong. Because when Jesus comes, it will be when no one expects it. As a thief in the night. But he's coming. And when he comes, I want him to find me faithful. But when he comes, I want him to find you faithful. I want him to find you striving to live for him. And we need to be a people who pray for the Lord's return. Pray for one another to be prepared for the Lord's return and who yearn for the Lord's return. I love the way the book of Revelation closes out the Holy Scriptures. Because John says this statement, he says, he declares, behold, I am coming quickly. And here's John's response. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. We need to be prepared and we need to pray for one another that we be prepared. If we're going to be a congregation that's abounding in love for one another, for our neighbors, for the community, for, for our enemies, it's going to begin by being a people who prays 
for one another, that we grow. Prayer, the Bible says, is powerful. And I know we say that, but do we live it? I'll tell you, I'm going to repent tonight, personally, and I'm going to commit that I'm going to pray more than I have. Now, I've prayed for all of you, but I'm going to pray more than I have. And not just when you're sick. I'm going to strive to pray, and I'll fall short, I'm sure, but I'm going to strive to pray for these other things in all of our lives that we grow in our faith, that we constantly be improving in our holiness and in our love for one another, and that we all be ready. Be it in 50 years, be his return next year, be his return tomorrow, or be his return now, that we all be ready. Tonight, if you look into your own faith and your own life and you think, I need to pray more for the brethren. I need to pray more for these people and, and have a life that's really taking up my brothers and sisters to the throne. Then join me in that commitment. You can do so from where you sit. Or you can take the brave step and say, I want to live more a life of a prayer warrior than I ever have. And you won't be alone because the preacher's already repented. And I'll already be up here with you if you choose to come forward as we stand and as we sing. If you would be dismissed through this closing song, someone will be there to assist you. Let's sing Higher Ground, first and last verse. Bow with me, please. Our God and our Father, we humbly approach Thee, giving praise to You and glorifying You. Father, we 
are so thankful and confident in the love that you had, that you sent your son, that he was sacrificed for us. And Father, we're so thankful for this day that we remember that sacrifice, that we're strengthened, and that we pray that we have glorified him in a manner that is pleasing. Father, we pray also that you have opened our hearts and that we have been strengthened. Father, we're focused this period on growing stronger together. And we pray that we grow in our love one for another, that we grow in our love for you. And Father, that we grow for those that are outside that we might strive to bring them of the knowledge and obedience and through your Son and the salvation that lies in him. Father, be, this, through, be with us this week that we might serve you and do those things that you would have us to do. And Father, we're mindful of so many of our number that are ill, so many that have COVID, and we recognize and know that you are the physician. We pray that you strengthen them guide the hands that are caring for them, that they might recover the measure of their health.